Hey, good afternoon, everyone. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Professor Margarita Diaz Andrew from the University of Barcelona. I first discovered <laughs> Marga's work um, in Barcelona last June because there was a special conference of European funded research projects, which is what she's here to talk about. Um, so it's a great opportunity to bring together some of our disciplines as well, of course, music, ethnomusicology, environment, history, archaeology, because these are all areas that she's including within her project. Um, so it's great that we've become, and we're, I'm really excited to hear more. Margaret has quite an established career and reputation. She's authored 20 books and numerous articles and lots of research students, and so we're going to hear a lot about all that work. So. Please welcome her talk on sounds and the sacred rock art soundscapes. Thank you very much, uh, Amanda, for this invitation, and thank you. I mean, for me, it's a pleasure to be um, here at the uh, University of um, Bath Spa, Bath Spa University. Um, right, and uh, as uh, Amanda said, uh, we met uh, last June in a conference. Uh, that was organized uh, for ERC projects. Uh, in fact, my ERC project hadn't even started um, then, and I said, you know, I mean, I can say what I uh, promised that I was going, I, I'm going to do, but, um, you know, don't uh, expect uh, results from me. Right, uh, now, um, yes, we have started, but we have just started, so let's see. Um, um, how uh, how it goes. At, uh, so we have now uh, started, but I guess two years down, down the line, I will be giving you uh, a very different talk um, to what um, I will um, give today. So what's the purpose of this uh, project, uh, Art Soundscapes? Um, my background is archaeology. I am an, an archaeologist. I've worked a lot on the history of archaeology that has nothing to do with this. I have also students in heritage and I also developed um, 20 years ago when I arrived in Durham University, uh, I sort of said, oh, how can they give me a job if I say history of archaeology? They are not going to give me a job because this is an archaeology department. So I said, oh, rock art. I said, oh, I haven't worked much on rock art, but um, you know, I, I'm planning to develop a line. And they gave me the job, and I have to work on rock art. Okay. <laughs> so I started, uh, I developed a line on uh, rock art research and enjoyed it. And, uh, but I've always tried to look at rock art, prehistoric rock art, from a, a different point of view. Most, most people looking at art, prehistoric art, just uh, the typology, the different type of motifs, this is a cross, this is something, you know. And I find that a bit boring. And um, about eight years ago, I think, um, now, um, I heard a talk from someone who was um, talking about um, the relationship between sound and, um, and rock art. And I thought, hmm, you know, I've just... Uh, been in this huge um, valley, um, looking, uh, locating all these rock art places. Let's see whether this works, thinking that it wasn't going to work. And uh, so um, uh, together with a student, um, um, a musicologist, uh, an archaeologist, someone <coughs> who combined both things, we did a very simple experiment, but the results were fantastic. And I thought, wow, there is something here. So I started to work on this uh, line of, which has uh, received the name of Archaeoacoustics. So um, anyway, I've had uh, several students, and in order to develop this uh, project, I sort of thought, OK, I have to apply for an ERC if I want all these uh, students, Marie Curie's and so on, who have been with me and have left uh, now Barcelona, I really need to develop an ERC project. Sat down, wrote it, and I was lucky enough that I got it. Okay, so um, we have just started. What is the purpose of this project? The purpose of this project um, is to put together, to, make, to look at the relationship, or the possible relationship between sound, rock art, and uh, sacred landscapes. And not in any type of societies, but societies, past, uh, hunter gatherers, uh, and early uh, agricultural societies around the world. Right, um, 
their team is not uh, complete, but uh, now uh, we, we are uh, a team of um, eight. Um, I am including Professor Carla Sester and Professor Angelo Farina, who are associated to the project, but uh, all the others are hired um, by the project. And um, the way in which um, uh, the, the, um, the idea of, uh, of the people working for the project now is, uh, is that I thought people specializing, or uh, in the case of Professor Farina, from the University of Parma, sort of helping us to develop the research line on acoustical physics. Then I have uh, Professor Carlos Sera from the Brain Lab in uh, the University of Barcelona um, developing um, the research lines of psychoacoustics and neuroacoustics. And there will be students um, uh, related to this um, side of the project, but it is. Uh, it is thought to start a bit later um, in the development of the project. And then I have an anthropologist, an ethnomusicologist, and a, a student who is in between archaeology and anthropology working with this research line on ethnography and, anthro uh, and the anthropology of music. Right, um, so this is uh, this connection this, uh, that I um, uh, I, I told you about uh, before, uh, we want to link these three aspects, sound, rock art, and uh, the sacred in landscapes. So, um, what can we, let, let's see this relationship first between uh, rock art and um, the sacred in landscapes. Um, in anthropological studies and ethnohistorical sources um, tell us that most hunter-gatherers uh, society and early agricultural societies around the globe believe that the world is ensouled, or numinous is um, also um, said. So they perceive, people perceive the landscape alike with people, that there is not, if they are other than human people. So things have a soul, things are alive. Not only people, but also animals and things. And uh, um, so the landscape sort of is alive, the whole um, um, landscape and its different parts. But there are some places in the landscape that have higher significance. And uh, in some cases, we know that these places are treated especially, and among the, the special treatments that these places receive um, is the painting or engraving uh, of uh, art um, in them, in their uh, walls. And we have some, uh, some examples um, of this um, that we know from India and from Australia. Uh, in this case, is uh, uh, still some of the practices that are going on um, nowadays in India. Um, so, and, uh, and we have from the ethno-historical sources, um, we also can sort of guess, using these um, sources, the significance of some of the engravings that the archaeologists are finding in the landscapes. For example, um, the sun, um, here uh, the representation of a dance that is related um, to, um, to shamanism, as the theory goes nowadays, or uh, in Siberia, um, how they, the, these uh, representations of um, masks are representing the supreme creators, and so on. So, um, th these are a way of um, treating especially these places and depicting in them um, some mythological um, stories or uh, uh, myths. But when we go to prehistory, we haven't got that information. Yes, uh, we can assume that um, a shelter like Cabal's here in La Valtorta, that's the board where I started, where I did my first uh, um, survey, 
we can suspect and we think and you know it has been it has been assumed by archaeologists that these places were special in some way and uh, that uh, they were um, they were so uh, and they were painted because because of the of of of, uh, of uh, the importance of people gave to um, these places, and these places is in the middle of the gorge. It's very close to um, to a very special passage uh, with uh, uh, through the rock and, and so on. So, uh, or this is another example uh, in this case in uh, France. This is a case also of a site that I had um, um, made the documentation of um, in Murcia, in Spain. Um, again, there's this rock that is sort of uh, has cracked from this rock face, and you have all these um, figures um, that uh, perhaps we could um, identify like the representation of a disease. That this is a plague that was found on top of a, of a dead body uh, of skeleton found in a calcolithic 3rd millennium uh, BC uh, tomb or burial um, in not, not that far from the area where these uh, paintings were made. So it, it looks like the paintings are not depicting usually scenes, they are depicting something of which the significance or the meaning we don't know because we have, we have lost the, the code, the cultural code to be able to, um, to interpret what they mean. We may we might may have hypothesis that you know some of them might be better grounded than other, but we will never know as archaeologists hundred percent what the answer is because we have lost the cultural code. Uh, but what we can see is that these are not representation of everyday life. Right. So. Uh, and so landscapes, um, uh, the places are given this special treatment uh, with rock art. Perhaps there were all other places, special places everywhere else that you know, had other treatments, but we've lost the information about them. But uh, it's the rock paintings stay and remain there, and this is why we know about them. There might have been many other places, and we've lost the information. So, um, but um, is there a relationship then between ensouled landscapes and sound? So let's have a look at, um, at this uh, relationship here uh, between the sacred landscapes and uh, sound. And uh, uh, the potential of sound to stimulate powerful emotions, make it a common medium for conferring places with extraordinary agents. I prefer when one uses this vocabulary, I prefer to write it. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I think that um, we know the emotion that music uh, may create. And we know the emotion and the effect that sounds in the landscape sometimes, sometimes creates uh, in, in us. And um, there is, for example, in Bali, in South Africa, although I'm mixing now with the rock art, uh, where um, the sonority of all this thunder and so on is, is amazing and the, the valley is full of rock art as well. So um, anyway, these uh, this, this, uh, sounds uh, are usually uh, connected in myths with, uh, with uh, uh, powerful uh, creatures, with animal spirits, ghosts, ancestors, there are a lot of myths, and we are going to see some um, later, I've got them up all over the world, um, in which uh, there's a connection between myth and um, sound. Um, there's also uh, this uh, relationship between music and um, uh, group cohesion. And, um, you know, I, I was thinking, I mean, it's not only the sound, uh, in sound in the landscape, in the large landscape, yes, this is, but it's also that, uh, that in a way people were living in the landscape and sound creates uh, cohesion. 
So music abilities and needs a, a selected uh, benefits of the practice of music. So that uh, there are other reasons also in groups or in, in terms of why people may have found it uh, interesting um, and um, also relate with, um, with the sacred. Um, but um, what um, do we know then about sounds in rock art landscapes? So if we um, go, we have done this uh, sort of uh, uh, relationship, we have looked at this one, let's um, have a look now at um, um, this one. And uh, we know uh, we have sources from ethno ethnography and anthropology. Uh, for example, we know that um, this is in Australia, and uh, it says uh, in the source that uh, we use that the site is associated with a particular type of sorcery called uh, Naru Bula Bula, um, which involves the painting of images in onto rock art and singing them with power songs to attract the life force of a targeted individual. So we have some sources in which we know <coughs> that music is involved in the act of painting. And uh, um, in this case, uh, I was going to move this slide, but I will explain now. Um, the ethnographic information is more to the north because this is the Sami area, and here they are not Sami anymore, but there are a lot of similarities. Uh, with uh, in, the, in terms of the location and the, the, the places with a special uh, significance and uh, these are uh, usually places with a lot of echo that in this area in Finland some of them at least have been painted and that we have also the traces of hands being put on top of the paintings uh, because sometimes you touch, as we are going to see an example now, you touch the rock to get the power of the rock. And uh, so the, all this area of Finland, um, Siberia, goes to the north of, um, the, uh, of, uh, of America, and it goes a bit also down um, in, uh, in America. We have um, a very similar set of beliefs of um, with importance of echo and belief of beings living within the rocks. Like um, here in Canada, uh, in the area of Quebec, is the Meme Awashio. It's called uh, in similar ways. Um, we have here Mikan West. So, you know, there are sort of different dialect uh, dialects uh, uh, talking or to give the name to this uh, being um, and this, this is a historical source. So this was one of the missionaries in the area that painted this Memewashio. Me me um, sometimes all these, so as far as I know, in this area we haven't got direct, um, direct sources telling us of people painting, but we know of people making um, this beach, uh, uh, beach uh, bark, bark uh, scrolls um, to explain the songs and the myths um, and so on. Uh, so these people are still, even if they don't make the paintings anymore, they still leave offerings in the area. This is in Canada. Um, um, and here we have a shaman um, in Siberia touching the rock and making um, a ritual in a place with um, rock art. So um, even if the paintings are not uh, uh, made uh, nowadays, uh, as far as we know, uh, there are still some of the rituals that continue in some of the areas, although in most uh, places, due to colonization or even before, um, things had um, disappeared. We also have some of the place names, uh, Boneco um, here, 
or this uh, one with relationship with birds and so on in all these areas, Canada. But I could show you some photograph of Finland that seems the same. Is uh, the landscape is sort of similar, and this is uh, a compilation of different beings, uh, including a classical echo um, that um, are linking um, uh, beliefs, religious beliefs, myths, and um, and uh, and uh, and uh, sound. And uh, if we go to anthropology. Um, the anthropologists um, tell us that uh, that there is this uh, that there is this link of uh, music and uh, and uh, ritual. For example, uh, Maurice Bloch um, said, "I very much doubt that an event observed by an anthropologist which did not contain these three elements speech, singing, and dancing would ever be described by him as uh, a ritual." In other words, these phenomena have been implicitly taken as the distinguishing marks of ritual. So ritual is linked to speech, singing, and dancing. Or um, in the case of Bruno Nettel, um, ritual involves music, the importance of music in ritual, and as it were, uh, in addressing the supernatural, seems to me to be a truly universal shared by all known societies, however different the sound, and so on. Um, however, I mean, uh, what I've been finding out in these three months that we are um, in, uh, in the project now is that the ethnomusicologists of the anthropologists are insisting there are no universals. We can <laughs> never say such a thing, blah, blah, blah. So, Anyway, I, uh, let's see how things develop and whether we can say, because I said, okay, if there are not, no universals, I don't need you in the project then, because you are not going to tell me anything that I can use for my project. So anyway, so let, let's, uh, uh, but at least uh, Bruno did not seem to think uh, something else, but you know, um, um, let's see. Um, so uh, what about then, um, rock art uh, and uh, sound, um, then uh, we have, um, the, the EOC project was based on a previous project, in fact, in two other previous projects, but uh, uh, in particular the one, so I started working in Valtorta, which was here, and then uh, in other places, and then uh, I had a Marie Curie student, Tommaso Mattioli, and we developed then uh, a method, so sort of methodologically we developed a method to measure acoustics that was much more precise than the one that we had before. And uh, in the Sonar project we worked in the Western Mediterranean, in Italy, in France, and um, in Spain. And uh, we were able to show several things, but um, um, for example, uh, we did uh, this uh, survey acoustic survey of uh, Bonbrune uh, in France when, where um, there is um, uh, 30, 43 shelters of which only eight have paintings. So if you have a place like this, okay, where would you say that the, 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 the motif, the painted motif was going to be placed? I, have, I would have no idea whatsoever. I would say they all look the same. And archaeologists have always been a bit surprised to see why they, they didn't paint here. Paint here. And, uh, so what we did in this case was to analyze the, the area acoustically. And we realized then that, that the places where the rock art had been placed were the places with more echoes. But it was not in, um, in um, absolute terms. People didn't have these um, things that recorders <laughs> and so on and sound sources and so on that we have. What they did probably, and it looks here, is that they, were, they, they walked and when there was one that seemed to have more echo than others, then they painted it. But in fact, if you compare this one uh, with some others, um, they are, you know, this one has much more, 
many more echoes. Okay, so um, so it is a relative measure. They were work, uh, walking through the cliff, all this, and then sort of locating. And for that, we have to assume that they, they were able to echolocate. Okay, so. They, and, and we have some ethnographic sources that tell us that people, some people were able to echolocate in the past because echo was important for them. So if you want to know where the spirit is living and the voice of the spirit is the echo, you, you may have a specialist uh, um, sort of searching for that, people with that uh, sense. So anyway, so it's a relative thing and we found that it more or less coincides, perhaps not that much here, but in any all in in the other places, perhaps here they made a mistake. But uh, <laughs> but uh, it sort of seems um, that it, it works. And we also did uh, some uh, in a different landscape in Italy, and the same happened. Uh, I haven't brought the slide. Uh, however, this doesn't happen everywhere. It is in some landscapes. It seems that this is what they were searching uh, for. And we have been able to identify this in one in France and one in Italy, in, in uh, the Gargano area. Um, however, a different type of um, thing we found in, um, in, uh, in Extremadura in Spain, close to Portugal. And this is audibility. So, they were searching, in this case, places where you could hear better what was going on in the landscape. And we, we hadn't thought about um, searching for this, and it was just that we were there, and we suddenly could hear, almost word by word, the conversation of a lady with her dog 300 meters down. And we thought, wow, this is amazing. And we thought, okay, we need to search to look whether this is an issue. And uh, as you can see in this graphic, all the places with rock art have better audibility than the ones, similar ones apparently, that haven't got um, rock art. So they were searching on purpose these places with higher audibility. And the places seem pretty similar. And it might be in the same uh, area, okay, um, and they look like, you know, a, a sort of shelters in the landscape, they, I wouldn't know where the, uh, the rock art, and that's, that's one of the difficult things in this type of research, you never know where the things are going to be, uh, because they all seem similar, but some of them have and some others not, and when you then start to look into this um, systematically, you see that in this case, it was an echo, it was audibility, and perhaps the type of ritual uh, of the, the, the type of um, what they were doing in, the, in those places was different. Um, and it, it, it could have been more a, a personal and individual um, ritual in, in, of someone who wanted um, to do, um, to have a sort of more um, uh, sort of conscience of the landscape, but being, it doesn't seem to, to have been a sort of a large um, thing going on. It could have been also a practical thing, but. You know, if you want it for a practical reason, why should you paint? Um, again, we really need to go to the sources and see what people were doing in other societies and see all the possibilities. Um, so, uh, we started uh, measuring in my first, um, uh, my first uh, articles on this. Um, we were doing, I was doing more or less what um, some others like Igor Retnikov, who is a historian of art in Paris, um, was doing in the 80s, reverberation, looking at re reverberation, resonance and echo. We've now developed uh, a much uh, more uh, sophisticated um, approach, and we are now looking at monaural acoustic parameters, uh, binaural, uh, then um, the spatial acoustic parameters of echoes and so on. But we are going, especially because also we worked in a cave that <coughs> could have been a Mayan cave, you know, when, when Tommaso didn't have a job, um, then we were invited to go to Belize, uh, mm -hmm. to a Mayan cave, to measure, no rock art, but we said, Belize, Mayan, uh, Mayan cave, 
let's go. <laughs> so, so then uh, we had to search for speech clarity and so on. So we, we then developed, started to develop uh, other things. Um, so and um, uh, being an ERC, we, wouldn't, we couldn't say, oh, we are going to go on just doing Western Europe. No, we had to go a bit more global. And uh, in, in a way, it's fun um, to do that. So we suggested that we were going to work in Baja California, um, then uh, that we, we were going to still do some work in, um, in, um, in uh, Western Mediterranean, and we were going to move also to Siberia. And we have added um, to that an area in uh, Namibia. So um, this means that the team, in fact, is uh, we have associated partners uh, a bit wider because we have, in fact, uh, Baja California, we have done it before because we were given some other money. So we, before the ERC, we've already done Baja California and we've, uh, we are now working um, uh, with the results. Uh, so we were working with the head of the INA, which is the National Institute of Anthropology and History and of Baja California Sur in Mexico. Um, with, uh, for Siberia, we were going to work with uh, Katia Deflet, but she had cancer and unfortunately, suddenly, um, she died uh, last uh, August. So um, we then uh, have um, um, agreed with uh, Andrzej Rot. Watskowski uh, from uh, Poland, and uh, we have already had a meeting uh, with him, and he has been in Barcelona. And for Namibia, um, we we count with um, the collaboration, the fantastic collaboration of Tillman Lenzen Epps, um, who has been um, studying a huge catalogue of uh, the Brandenburg in uh, Namibia, and then we will be collaborating, of course, with uh, people in Namibia. So this is the last day of our work in Baja California. Um, so, but then, you know, when you go to the field and you start uh, working uh, with, um, uh, in, 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 in the sites and the places, then uh, there's, you, you, you start seeing the complexity of things. Because, I mean, Baja California, for example, uh, Baja California was, uh, Cortes arrived there, but he said, oh, there's no empires to, um, you know, to conquest here, no, no money, no silver, left. <laughs> and uh, it was really, um, the missions that started there in the 17th, and especially in the 18th century, but they had a huge impact. But, um, you know, given that it's the 18th century, we have sources by the missionaries that tell us things about the people living there. And what they say is that already at that time, they said that the paintings had been made by giants. I mean, the paintings in themselves, they are huge, and you need a um, um, uh, folder to, um, um, to make them, uh, because this is, is too, they, are, they are huge. Um, so we really don't have direct ethnographic sources. And then if you start looking at the ethnic composition of, um, as far as we know, of Baja California or California itself, um, it's, um, you know, you find there are many, many different groups. So the complexity is huge. So it is now that we are starting to look into um, the fine grain of, of the project, and so when you face uh, the reality of the different places, when you say, right, uh, I'm sure that I will be able to say things and so on, but it's not going to be that as easy as um, I thought. Um, um, so um, we are now reading all these uh, ethno-historical sources, and uh, and we know that in some areas in California, um, echoes are really, really important. But it doesn't seem to be the case in the area that we've uh, surveyed here in the San Francisco Sierra, Sierra San Francisco, um, here. Um, here they were, the Cochinese were um, uh, living, and uh, it doesn't seem that, that, that they, were, they gave such an importance to echo. 
but we are finding some relationships with um, some other things. But uh, uh, we are in the middle of analyzing the data. Then there are also other practical problems, like uh, we surveyed acoustically the whole of the canyon, uh, but there were always wind. And you know, and that really affects the measurements and so on. So there are practical things out there that you think that in, a, in, a, in an ideal world, it, it, things are going to work, but uh, mm -hmm. sometimes things are a bit more difficult. Right. In Siberia, where we will be going with um, uh, Rob Watkowski, um, we, have, um, um, we have identified two areas where we want uh, to work, Altai and Minusinsk. And uh, uh, the field work in Altai will be done in um, August. Uh, again, you start sort of discussing with the experts of the rock art in the area. There are representations of um, shamans, like for example, this is, is highly likely that this is shaman, it has the drum, as uh, the representation of the drum. Um, but, uh, but many of the representations are in very uh, uh, thin engravings then, and uh, it seems that in, in uh, Andrzej uh, Rothwatkowski's uh, opinion, he, he thinks that perhaps shamanism is sort of relatively new in the area. So uh, again, sort of this is the classical area of um, shamanism, um, Siberia, but uh, perhaps we are going to deal with um, with rock art that is not necessarily related with shamanism. In this case, yes, but in, in some other cases, perhaps uh, it is not. So, but you can see um, these, um, you know, uh, drums that uh, the shamans um, were using and are using still. <laughs> so you have the representation of this drum here, and uh, there are um, many um, representations. That. So let's see what happens. Um, <coughs> it is very rare that um, that uh, archaeologists who have worked on rock art in those areas ever say anything about the acoustics because you know nobody has been thinking about about it. Even me, when I went to Valdorta and looked for all these places, I never paid any attention to that. And from the all the Valtorta in, uh, in Spain, this is a place that has been surveyed uh, since um, 1917. So many, many people have been in Valtorta, and I could only find two comments about the acoustics of the area in all the literature by archaeologists. Mm -hmm. So it can be, you know, then you are there and you measure cabals and you have all these echoes and you say why nobody has mentioned this or you are down in the valley and people are discussing you have to, you have a group of tourists looking at and uh, at the at the paintings and it is almost audible what the, the person up there is saying so it's so evident but we are not used to pay any attention to the to sounds or to acoustics and therefore, archaeologists have never uh, have never written about, or have rarely written about it. And it's the same with anthropologists. And so, uh, whenever we go to the sources, it's very, very rare that we find information, the information that we are looking for. Uh, with shamanism, uh, yes, we will find a lot of information about the drums and their typologies and every single Russian museum, or museum in Russia has drums and so on, but, uh, but the, the acoustics of the landscape is something that hasn't been paid much attention to. I went to Mircea Eliade, uh, you know, all his books about shamanism, looking at what he had said about the acoustics of the landscapes and shamanism, he doesn't mention anything. It was just shamanism, and trans and so on, but nothing about the landscape. And the other area that uh, we want to work, and this, this will be probably next year, um, uh, 2000 and, so 2020, um, yeah, um, it is the Brandenburg 
in, um, in Namibia or Taureb. And this is a geological formation, a mountain, a huge mountain, or um, mountain, it's not a range, it's a um, mountain system, I don't know, uh, of about 30, 30 by 25 kilometers. And it must have been a magical mountain, because you can see this mountain or this set of mountains from very far in the landscape, but it's an area where you don't find animals, you know, a sort of large game doesn't exist, so hunter-gatherers, they can gather and get, uh, um, get uh, some food there, but, you know, hunter-gatherer groups, in order to survive easily, they need um, um, prey. And, uh, and there's no, none in this area, and the sites that have been excavated um, show that uh, they, they weren't. However, you find, I mean, you have, most of the paintings are of humans, but there are also um, animals depicted, but animals that were not in the mountain itself. So hunter-gatherer groups, in order to survive, they need to exchange people, to exchange things, and it is common that they have what is called um, agglomeration um, sites, and they meet once uh, in a year somewhere. And it, is, it might be highly likely that this was going on here. So it is a holy mountain, it is a mountain that people don't go to hunt, it's a mountain where you go and meet other people, and so let's see what is, what, what is going on um, there and uh, to what extent acoustics uh, might have had to do also with the selection of sites. Because the paintings are not everywhere. For example, we are going to, um, to do, I think it's this valley here, it's either this or this one, um, that is very narrow and uh, it has several lithophones, so ringing rocks. So we want to see why exactly or what, you know, what, to what extent we can find uh, um, of the acoustic landscape, the of extension of, of these um, lithophones. But lithophones are only here, uh, and then uh, you have some paintings in this valley, and then you have some up other paintings in this valley, and some up here, but they are not everywhere. So they are selecting places to paint. Why are they selecting those ones and not others? And could um, uh, the sound have something to do uh, with it? So, um, so I've uh, been explaining a bit um, you know, what we are going to do, sort of the parameters and the places that we are going to measure. Um, then, uh, uh, sacro acoustics, as I said, uh, they will start um, uh, soon, but uh, they haven't. We have had meetings, as I will show you a photograph now, um, because what I've been doing in these three months is just putting everybody together, and we have one um, seminar every week is either from, ex from people who come to tell us about their work, something related to us, or to, uh, to the project, or ourselves, we do a reading week, something, and then a, a meeting, and then the, the reading um, um, thing or, or something, so that everybody, that we are exchanging information continuously, and that the project can grow as a group of people together, thinking together. Because in this large project, what you may have is that people start working on their own, not knowing what the others are doing. And then, you know, and then it is very difficult to do something together. But by meeting every week, by talking all um, about what we are doing, I ask them to tell me briefly what they have been doing so that everybody knows what everybody's doing and then we have a topic in which we think and, that, and then we think uh, about. Anyway, um, so, uh, and with psychoacoustic, I was explaining this because with psychoacoustic, even if it, they haven't started, what I've done is to put together the anthropologists, the, uh, uh, the professor in physical acoustics, and um, you know, and, and the, the members of the project that are dealing with that, and we have had already a first meeting because when we go to the field, we need to know what the psychoacousticians are going to need from us. 
So it is very important that, that we are on the same page, that we don't go to all these places that are really far and then come back and then they say, oh, why didn't you code it something, X or Y? So um, uh, it might happen anyway, but I'm trying to avoid that. Uh, uh, so um, in, the, in the case of psychoacoustics, um, we are going to, um, to look at the sensations that people have when in, in situations similar to where, as if they were in the places where we are going to take, to take all these measurements. So all the three uh, sensations. Then the problem is, what music could we use for that? So I've, that's why I wanted to the anthropologist to talk with the psychologist, and, and also um, to see, for example, if we want to use some music, do we need to record that music in an, an echoic chamber? But then we have all these problems of people who are uh, playing in an, an echoic chamber don't have the, the sensation of the music that they need <coughs> to feel the music. So we've been dealing with all these um, problems and, and so on. So subjective impressions of sounds, um, participants and the control laboratory conditions using immersive and interactive technology. But then the problem is, and this, the, I was asked this six months ago when we had that meeting, and, and still is something that, you know, uh, that we will try to, to, uh, to answer is, to what extent, uh, you know, all these sensations are very cultural. The music is cultural, the sensations are cultural. How we are going, to what extent what we do is going to be valid um, dealing with landscapes that are not a part of the world, with music that we don't even know, and um, with uh, a different type of cultural background. Um, you know, all these are very valid criticisms that we will try to answer more or less satisfactorily, um, but I am, we are conscious about them and we are going to try to think about them. And there's so much that we can do because we cannot go back to the past. We cannot talk to the people who were producing all these paintings and making, we don't even know the music that they were producing. We might know some of the instruments, but we don't even know what type, for example, if they were singing, what techniques were they using uh, for their singing. Um, so, um, anyway, but nobody has done this in archaeology, so let's see what comes out of it. And here is this in the psychology department, uh, next, uh, next to the brain lab, you know, with all these um, things. And, uh, you know, this is Professor Farina, but here we have uh, uh, Professor Sera, um, who is the psychologist, neuropsychologist. So we were, we put, uh, and this is the anthropologist, Dörte Bake, because I've, I've put together a very international group of scholars. So I have Italians, Romanians, um, Germans, um, who else? Uh, and oh. French, yeah. Uh, neuroacoustics, um, then uh, testing whether stimulation of the brain uh, with the same side uh, sound recordings used in, uh, in the previous, in the psychoacoustics um, experiments can induce patterns of brain activity related to, um, uh, to, the, to those associated with altered uh, or mystical states. The idea is if we are thinking about um, shamanism and trance is an, an, an important factor in shamanism, can we have something similar listen in the same conditions as, as we would uh, hear. Then the anthropologist comes to me and says, but people are not going to be able to move. No, because in neuropsychology you cannot move, but movement <laughs> is absolutely essential for music. Okay, what can we do? Okay, so we are conscious of all those um, limitations. So again, we were visiting the um, pseudo um, uh, anechoic uh, chamber that they use for this uh, for the uh, neuroacoustic things and um, so anyway um, we are searching for all these uh, uh, these uh, ethnographic sources and historical sources and sort of uh, then uh, trying to 
you know, uh, trying to see whether all that or to what extent they can help us. So, as you can see from uh, my talk here, uh, uh, this is, uh, it, we are still in the very first uh, three months of this uh, project. There are lots of questions un uh, to answer now, or open questions uh, by now. Um, there are many things, many challenges, but that's uh, where we are. And uh, we haven't got the web page now, but if you want to know all the things that we have organized uh, so far, um, if you go to Facebook, and uh, our Facebook is Art Soundscapes, and you will find uh, what we have been doing um, there. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, that was terrific. And I'm sure lots of people here will have ideas sparked off by several of the things that you've been saying for their own work. I am very struck by the notion of audibility, uh, which allows for um, uh, an increased expression outwards into the landscape from inside uh, the cave, but also the ability to listen to the ambient music that is outside the cave, that might have a number of practical benefits. Uh, the sound of the river might have changed and now allow for a crossing in order to be able to hunt that species on the other side. The mating sounds of prey species might indicate a change of season. Um, I wonder whether you were considered testing for specific species, like a, a wolf sound or the owl. Uh, where, where these creatures, the music from these creatures, is the spirit speaking of them into a society in the cave. So I'm just kind of thinking about the ecology, as it were, and the, and the ability to listen to the ecology, to be in tune with it. I think that we would uh, first search, have to search for the information about this in ethno-historical sources and ethnographical sources to see whether this is something, and I guess, you know, I, I have never thought, uh, um, I hadn't um, thought about, about it. Um, whether, but, I mean, is that going to be something that is going to be specific to the places that I am measuring mm. because of Roca? I think probably not, but uh, but I, I I don't know. If I find some information, you know, we are reading and reading. Mm. Um, if we identify that that might be a thing to look at, we will do. Mm. But uh, there are many aspects of the relationship between the landscape and people. We cannot measure everything, so we are sure. going to start from where. Sure. But if yeah. I find that there is a connection, then we will be thinking about it. See, we, we now have uh, Sam Lee singing folk songs to nightingales in Sussex, yeah. and we have, you know, David Rothenberg playing his clarinet to um, birds, species, and so on. And, and, and I wonder whether then that might have been a feature of ritual activity, yeah. the actual exchange yeah. but, yeah, I mean, of, of human music with the eco but ecological it's music. It's a very good thing about if, if there was a lot of rain and you could hear the water coming down, well, it, and you could hear when the sounds outside have changed, so that gives you an idea of the landscape. Mm -hmm. I think that's brilliant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the St Stephen Feld in the in the seventies did yes. this work in the Kaluli, uh, on the Kaluli, and uh, and uh, then obviously the 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 birds and all these myths and so on. It is it's a key thing, um, but I think that would be another project. If I go into that, I think um, that would be different. Mm -hmm. Okay, but yes, it is important. But whether I should be looking into that, if I see a connection, I will. But if I don't, I prefer to stick foot with what I am doing. Mm -hmm. But yes, I, I know, and I know that there is literature that is important about all these uh, aspects. Rock art covers a huge spectrum, and I'm wondering how you determine what kinds of rock art in which places you're going to investigate and which you're not. 
what, what we have done, for example, the Baja California is full of rock art in many places. And uh, so we've um, gone to places where we thought that the catalog of sites was good enough for us not to waste the time, our time searching for the places. Then we find out, found out that every map had different coordinates for the places. So we, about two days ago, we had uh, a Skype meeting with our um, colleague in uh, Baja California, California to sort of say, right, which one is the right one? But because even the GPS, that we took two GPS uh, um, coordinates from two different they, they didn't even go inside because you need to have the satellites and you're in a canyon. So GPS are not as good as they should be um, in the conditions where we were in the middle of nowhere uh, down in a canyon. canyon. So uh, we, what we do is try to find places where the catalog, and where we find people who are going to help us. So if I try to go to Russia without anybody with me, you know, first I don't speak Russian, I don't know the places, I don't know, you, you, need, you need to have reliable people out there. So I think that the selection of places is more related to practical reason, reasons than anything, anything else. So it's just, um, in the case of Russia, we've um, tried to, we, we have sort of said, uh, I mean places where we know where there is some ethnography about shamanism because then we will be able to check um, to use all these sources and that could be useful. But so there are practical reasons. There could be many other places. Yes. I was really interested as a, to pick up on the on the potential criticisms you anticipated about the you know, the cultural nature of sensing. Um, I co-directed an AFSC network on sensory methods across different disciplines in the UK, Germany, and Spain. One of the things that was really interesting that in Barcelona, kind of all the participants were so much more sensory aware than in the other two cities. So I don't know whether that's a, a coincidence that you, you, know, you started your, your project there. But I wondered, are you dealing with, and then one of the things we noticed was that what we sensed in any particular environment was totally determined by our training. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what we heard, saw, smelled, and, and then what we thought it out. So I wonder whether, are you, are you kind of um, using anthropological methods to contextualize kind of how your own cultural context influences your research or um, or did you, did you know, sort of have conversations or notice across the team that what you pick up was, was relatively different? Or is the distance of the periods you're dealing with is so far away that um, it's not really a relevant question for you? I mean, the, the, it is very distance in time. Uh, more, uh, so we, we are not going to be able to discuss things with people, but I have the anthropologist there saying, Oh no, this is cannot be right because you know there's all these. So you know, I they are the ones who are bringing me to you know to earth and sort of saying be careful. Um, so I know that this that I really need to think about about cultural difference. And this was a criticism that was made six months ago. And I even had uh, I was going to have a PhD student coming from Germany, and she said, oh. I think your, your uh, research is very simple and blah, 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 and um, she completely refused to come. And I said, okay, if she's so simple to think that mm -hmm. I'm not aware of all these criticisms, <laughs> and if she's so, she's not flexible, perhaps it's better that I don't have her. <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, I know that this is a real problem, an actual problem, but in fact, it's one that we have with almost everything in archaeology. Yeah. And any, um, anything that deals with the past, I mean, that's also what we concluded. It's a problem we have and we just have to deal with it. Yeah, we have to deal with it and we have to say what our weaknesses are and, and uh, we, never, we, we will never be able to say what was going on in the past. What we will be able to say was what was not going on. I think that's, that's, that's really what we are doing, archaeologists. 
we are saying there are all these possibilities, all these alternatives, and these are all the weaknesses of the things that I am saying. But for certain, you know, no UFOs or something. Okay? <laughs> or... Uh, yes. You made a comment about that uh, very thing growing of the um, subway in Russia, because I was born and bred in Russia. Right? And you said one of, the, one, of the, one of the theories you said that shamanism is not is not long there. You know, it's not, it's, not, uh, it's it's strange you should say that because um, in my research I'm, I'm researching government music and uh, one of the things I um, encountered so far was uh, this report. Uh, the rock drawing was discovered in 1989 in Kazakhstan on a plateau like there, mm -hmm. and um, it's um, it's it's depicted four dancing people and one musical instrument. And they think, you know, the rock, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the rock comes from the Neolithic period, which somewhere between 10,000 years, maybe, and 4,000 years. And, um, I would like to read that, um, that research, yeah. Yeah, yeah that would yeah. be and, uh, good. And also, in this, um, in, the, in this book written by uh, Theodore Levin, Mountains of the Mountains, the Rivers and Mountains Saint, this is all, this research has been done in, uh, in Tuva, in Altai region, mm -hmm. and um, uh, it's it's about local musicians and how they find caves. Mm -hmm. And uh, my understanding for them, they're looking for the um, for the natural rebirth. Mm -hmm. And um, my understanding is, uh, uh, well, if you take for example throat singing, mm -hmm. you know, throat singing is when you can do three or four voices in, in just one singing, so you can you can hit the high pitch and the low pitch. I think you know to develop that culture takes a long time. Mm -hmm. So, and we believe because our ancestors came from Siberia and they were living in caves. We, as you know, settled nomadic people, we believe that uh, our ancestors lived thousands and thousands of years ago. So, I think you know, the shamanism is to buy an altar is the birthplace of shamanism. Mm -hmm. um, something about it's a very interesting notion that. Uh, not many artifacts are left. It's probably because of the nomadic culture. So and the, also uh, because of the of, because the materials are frail. So they you, you you only find them in very special conditions. But most of them, most of the drums, uh, for example, for prehi uh, from prehistory in um, in uh, Europe have disappeared. Yeah. The flutes, we have flutes because they are made of bone, and bone, unless it's a very acidic um, uh, terrain, they are kept. So we find the flutes in some of the places, especially in caves, because they are well kept there. But many of the flutes that might have been uh, lied, uh, uh, may have been left uh, lying around, they have disappeared. So we have very few instruments for the past. We have whistles, we have uh, flutes, a few <coughs> drums, especially when they are made of, um, of uh, with um, uh, with uh, pottery, mm -hmm. and in some cases we have some. But if they are made with frayed materials, most of them have disappeared. But yes, I mean, you know. But they used to sing because of the distances. Yeah. Because if you say something, you can't hear. But if you sing, mm -hmm. you know, miles away, you know, they can hear what you're saying. And this is the songs where they were well communicating. Maybe therefore, you know. Doesn't leave long. Yeah. 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 yeah, when I was saying uh, relatively recent, I think he was thinking about 500 years, 1,000 mm -hmm. years. Okay, but that's <laughs> where so it's so. <laughs> uh, But uh, it might have been more than that if they are talking here about the Neolithic in a place, if it has been found in a stratigraphy or with associated material that is Neolithic then I haven't got a problem. I, I was just repeating what the expert in the area was telling me. Uh, but uh, so I'm not an expert in the archaeology there, but it would be nice um, to have this uh, information. I think it's uh, because they are so thin engravings and um, that he sort of thought this might, especially some of the engravings, um, he thought he had the impression because of the way in which they had been cut, yeah. that perhaps you need metal to be able to trace that line. And if you need metal, you are not in the Neolithic. 
Yeah, but their, so focus, their, their focus has always been, you know, poetry and music. Mm. So they're not very good at drilling things. Yeah. This is this is <laughs> what I see from, from my uh, from mm. my research. Yeah. There's always poetry. Okay. That you but um, it would be nice to have that. And yes, I mean, I'm happy to look to I'm read happy. everything. I'm <laughs> the, the the mountain of the bibliography mountain I have because when I was preparing this ERC. I was sort of looking at something as sort of it's like I had this impression of uh, having a port there and opening it and all these books and publications. <laughs> and <boom. laughs> I opened the next one and the same happened. So because I was reading from so many different disciplines and trying to make to write something that made sense, and uh, so yes, I'm happy to read that as well. Yeah, I was just wondering, you just typed it there, I was wondering about the relationship of you are having archaeology, anthropology, maybe ethnomusicology. How are you sort of swimming into that? I'm trying to swim, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yes, I have, uh, I mean, there's uh, people in the team that I, I hope that they will be able to contribute in ways that we end up making something that makes sense, you know, or, you know building something that makes sense. So um, Raquel Jiménez Pasalos, who is one of the team members, she works in the, uh, in the Department of Ethnomusicology in the University of Valladolid, so she's working part-time for us, and she was trained as an archaeologist. So she has the right knowledge for me okay. to put these two things together. Um, then Dörte Weig um, comes from Cologne, uh, the University of Cologne, where they have also an ethnomusicology um, uh, group, a very powerful one. And she also did some work with archaeologists. So again, I have in her, she's, she was working with the Baka uh, people somewhere mm -hmm. in, in so um, in Africa, and uh, so again, she can. She was a very good friend of Tillman, who I knew also for many years. So, so again, I have someone there who is able to put things together. Um, Tommaso Mattioli is um, is an archaeologist, but he has been able to develop all this physical acoustic methodology with uh, Professor Farina. So. You know, we are putting things together and trying to crisscross mm -hmm. all these disciplines and, and let's see what comes up. But That's not easy. This is the challenge. <laughs> and, right. So far, you know, uh, we are having a good time. So there's no, <laughs> there's no anthropology so far? Anthropology is um, Dörte Weig. Oh, okay. uh, she is the um, she is the anthropologist. Oh, okay. But she is very interested in movement and she is the one who insists me that really we shouldn't uh, be talking about music without talking about movement as well. And I say, look, but how are we going to retrieve that information from the past? So this, this is, you know, music is difficult, movement is even more. Yep. So. Um, I, I wondered if you would be working with shamans in these places as well, and if you'll be making rituals and ah. approaching it through that? Uh, in Baja California, all, all the traditional um, way of life has disappeared now. You have the people living in ranchos and they are like the Texans with the same hats that you find. I was a bit surprised. Uh, no, they, so it has gone. Um, in uh, Siberia, I really don't know. In Altai, uh, I, I really um, I have no knowledge of what is going on there, so because we have just had this uh, meeting with, uh, with Andres, uh, but in theory we are not going to do anything, uh, you know, that would be, that would be adding a, um, uh, one more complexity. I know that uh, Raquel has been doing some ethnomusicology uh, work in, or musicological work, in uh, Morocco, and she has been working with shamans, which I never thought that there were shamans in Morocco, but apparently there are, um, uh, and she has been doing some work with a professor in Valladolid. But uh, in principle, we were not thinking of doing that. I think that if we do, 
uh, you know, I mean, with these projects, you can go in many, many directions, and one has to be careful instead of saying, okay, this is what I have to do. And then if you have the time, you move on and you do other things. But if you don't, if, if you are not, if you don't try to be a bit um, uh, harsh with yourself, then the, the, whole, the whole thing could be excluded. So that would be extremely interesting. I mm. acknowledge that, but that would be a different project. One that mm. would be very interesting for us in a way, but I think that, um, you know, um, I think that at the moment I have to rest re restrain myself of going into other things because that would be a project in itself. A very interesting one. I would love someone to do that so that I can read it and use it for my research. Yes, I know, but I'm an archaeologist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's just and interesting, is it, how you approach, do you bring a sacred approach <clears throat> to the sacred? You know, it's a bit like if you're looking at a church, are you going to go into it at any point? And I'm, I'm, you just, yeah, as an experiential mm. way of coming to that with your senses and with traditions in these places as well that have been there. I'm, I'm sure millennia. that I would learn a huge amount from it. Um, I'm, I'm sure, but that wouldn't give me any, I mean, yes, that from that learning I would learn a lot. But as I said, I think I, I don't want to go into that, at least for the moment. I, I, uh, otherwise, you, you can get things, things can get out of control if you start fully following lines that are interesting and then you know you you haven't got the time to do what you have to do so at the moment i don't think and i'm sure that i would learn a lot but whatever is going to go in those rituals will be very different to yeah, what was going on in the past mm. because the, cult, the the time has gone uh, has passed uh, and things change groups continuously change so not in our time <laughs> That's what you think. Um, That's what anthropologists think. No, that things don't change, but archaeologists can demonstrate that things change con continuously. Ah, okay. That's the interesting thing. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, things change, but in some places there are remarkable continuities. Um, I'm intrigued by um, what you'll find in your Australian case study. Um, where there is, you know, it's the kind of most ancient, continuous culture on earth. Um, the people who created the really ancient rock art um, in Australia um, probably had some, some different ideas and different practices from contemporary Aborigines, but in the north and centre of Australia there's very, very strong cultural continuity. And in, in a sense, it would help to um, uh, not fully answer, but to address to some extent um, Astrid's point about the kind of cultural, um, kind of cultural influence on kind of sensory experience. If you're actually working, if you go, this is a marvelous example of an interdisciplinary and international research project. But um, you've got anthropologists, you've got anthropologists on the team. You've got the opportunity to make it kind of transdisciplinary and actually be working with local indigenous people to help you to interpret these sites, um, just as a, as a further source of knowledge. Um, and uh, it, it could be really exciting. You don't have to do it, but you can work with <laughs> no, anthropologists no, 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 on your teams. You don't need to I do think, it. Uh, right, but when, when, I, yeah. when I started with Russia, when I was going to work with Katya Deflet, the first thing I asked her is, is there an anthropologist out there in Russia who is interested in sound? Mm -hmm. And she said, I don't know of anybody. And I said, I also want someone who goes to the sources, who start reading. I mean, the Russian material, Andres can read Russian, I, I can't. Uh, uh, this uh, last Christmas we have had, uh, uh, Raquel has been in Paris reading French uh, anthropology on Siberia because we want to read German and French and Italian if there were, but no, there won't be, or Spanish there won't be, um, but at least as much as we can read from what has been uh, written from the area. So about Baja California, we've been reading in uh, Italian, in German, in Spanish. Um, you know, we are trying to, to get uh, as much as possible. Anyway, the, um, uh, Katia Deflet um, told me uh, there isn't anybody. 
I don't know whether this is completely true because you know sometimes we are so specialized in our little area that I'm sure and an Andrej told me that he knew of someone who could be useful for um, that. In terms of um, Australia, you know, in Australia, in the Kimberley, you have an ancient tradition of rock art that um, is the Bro Brad Bradshaw figures, and that has nothing to do with the newest uh, rock art um, uh, tradition, um, which is the uh, the, the Wanjina tradition and so on. So, Again, uh, we have some tradition, but it's not that they have always been doing the same. No. As archaeologists, we can demonstrate that this is not the case. There have been changes in the area. Uh, if we didn't um, um, choose, uh, if, if I didn't choose um, uh, Australia, was because when, whenever I asked uh, uh, people, uh, our archaeologists there, they, they completely denied that uh, sound had anything to do, acoustics had anything to do with the rock up there. And, uh, and I thought, okay, I'm not sure, probably this is not the case, but uh, if I'm not going to have the type of help that I would need someone enthusiastic out there um, to support this research and to open doors like permits and so on, then you know the world is wide and I can work in uh, Baja California, I can work wherever, I will leave Australia for whenever they become interested <laughs> and then they will search for a different source. But yes, I mean, we have, we have people there, but people are changing. So have they got, uh, you know, they are not, uh, they are, some, in some cases they are still repainting um, the rock art, but with acrylic painting, paint and they are paid by the state and not the, the right people are painting and not, you know, uh, things have changed. Mm. There's this pristine uh, group out there. There will be a couple, but um, not really. They, that, all that world has changed. It's changed, but, but, there, but there are continuities. And, and as I said before, the, the, the interesting thing is um, not necessarily that you will be able to have some unmediated access to ancient um, experiences in those places or practices, but rather that you will have non-Euro-Western um, you know, participants in the project who, who you know, have, who've had a different kind of sensory cultural uh, training and also a different understanding of, of the environment and indeed of the sacred. Yeah. Um, then there's also a practical thing here and is when uh, we had to establish all the agreements with the ERC, one of the most difficult things was uh, because we are working with neuropsychologists and psychoacousticians, it's the same person, but okay, it could have been two, um, they were very worried about the ethical implications. So we managed to say, okay, we are just going to work with people from here. We are not going to go. They thought that we were going to go to the places to do all these mm. experiments. And then uh, the complications would have been tremendous. It doesn't mean that I, I, I'm not doing it because of that. Um, but, um, uh, but, uh, but that would be an obstacle mm. to surmount if I wanted to do that. But yes, why not? And I think uh, in, the, in the same way that, I mean, at least from the anthropological type, uh, from the anthropological side, we could do um, some things. And once we have done what we have to do, then it will be thought. Okay. We will consider it. But first, one has to do what has to do. Otherwise, you, you never end. You end up not doing what you have to do. Yes, I, un I, I understand that that's a very interesting um, side uh, project that we could develop. I wonder what kind of equipment are you using to measure this sound? With, uh, right, with equipment we had, when we started with the Marie Curie project, um, with, well, Tommaso Mattioli started with the Marie Curie project, um, we wanted to create a more sophisticated type of measurement because until then I had been using a very, very simple with uh, method with um, with a PhD student um, this one, with someone else. So uh, the problem for us 
is that, uh, as in the case of Baja California, but even if we go to Italy or to Spain, we are, you know, in Val Torta, sometimes you have to climb two meters and you, have, you are in difficult landscapes. And there's no way that we could go with the type of equipment that the architects or the acoustical engineers use. So we, we cannot take a huge loudspeaker, we cannot take, I don't know, um, 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 how to say, a generator. So we needed small equipment that we could put in our rucksacks and go anywhere and do um, the work. And uh, uh, so and that was the difficulty, what, one of the most difficult things that we had when we started, when especially this is Tommaso's um, field, really. Um, I didn't do much about that, but he searched and searched and searched, and then uh, he found that there was someone in uh, Japan who was uh, doing, who had this very, or who had developed a method with very small equipment, and someone in Italy, which is Professor Karina. He wrote an email to both, the Japanese never answered, and Farina answered. <laughs> Perhaps it was in Italian, so it was easy, so they communicated fantastically well. So anyway, we, we started to work with um, Angelo Farina. So what we are doing, we have, um, uh, we have uh, microphones uh, in mon uh, uh, by, um, uh, we have this, um, um, let me, let me find the, the, the word. Uh, one that has sort of um, the, the omnidirectional microphone, mm. and we have also one that has sort of an eight capsule um, sort of head. They are very small, they are sort of this size, and we then plug it to a recorder, that to um, an H2 recorder or an H4 recorder, depending on the microphone. So it's everything is very small. So we, we, we this is this has allowed us to do this is sort of for, for sound recording. For um, to make the sound um, when the the circumstances when they are difficult, we use balloons and uh, a sound source. And uh, so it's a sound source that was the traditional one and that. Um, and that uh, is still being used in some cases, and um, and uh, they are sort of a particular type of air balloons uh, with a particular dimension, and we uh, we uh, explode them at a, a fixed uh, um, um, distance from the microphone, so everything is sort of controlled. And, and above our heads, so that we don't create a shade in, um, for, the, for the measurement. Um, so uh, we've used um, that one. We could have used pistols, but usually we are not allowed to uh, go onto a plane with a pistol. <laughs> so, and also we could have used um, uh, firecrackers, but we are working in very dry landscapes, usually and also protected landscapes. So there's no way. So balloon seems that is the thing that is, you know, nobody is worried about the balloon being exploded. <laughs> so you mean the, the, the room balloon to blow in? Yes, but wow. they are sort of a size, they're a bit of a larger size, it's not the uh, little ones that uh, children use, they are a bit larger. The problem is that they are discontinuing them. So the last time I went to the shop, I bought the whole lot. Um, <laughs> Uh, for this measurement, because then <coughs> otherwise, I mean, when we use the new ones, we will have to go to Parma again to take all this, uh, uh, you know, because everything has to be sort of controlled to be able to use, uh, yeah, and to be compared, to be to have measurements that are comparable. Um, we have also used um, a loudest speaker with a sound sweep, and uh, but for example, we had a problem in Mexico that uh, Iron Mexico completely refused to allow us to, um, to uh, put on board the loudspeaker because they said, oh, it has magnets, blah, blah. You know, I think that the guy just had a bad day. And <laughs> so anyway, we had to send it uh, by, um, um, by DHL. 
uh, it took a couple of more days, and then a donkey down the, the, the canyon, and so on. So, you know, I mean, it's not that easy. I mean, in this case, we had a donkey that could take a huge box and so on, um, with the loudest speaker, well protected, and so on. But if in Namibia, if we go up uh, the mountain, we will have to carry everything, including water, water for all the days that we are there. So I'm not sure to what extent. So we are now devising a different type of uh, of, um, of, equip of equipment as well. This is also part of the of the of the project. It's such an ambitious project. I wonder if you could say something about the logistics and the practicalities of working with these different, so many different disciplines in a very focused way, and how that might have changed even just over the last few months. Um, as I said, uh, you know, for me, you know, having the anthropologists saying, "Oh, but there are no universals," and uh, I need <laughs> universals to be able to apply them to the past. No, in the 60s they were trying to get universals to uh, to devise universals, and there was no way, and they, they they agreed in the end that there were no universals. Okay, but perhaps at some point there's no, at a particular level there are no universals, but at lower level perhaps the Anyway, so yes, uh, that, that has brought more challenges. Um, and as I said before, uh, earlier, uh, I said, okay, if there are no universals, why need you there here in the project? Mm. Uh, so I hope that they will give me some sort of reason why, why uh, I have them. But yes, I mean, things get more complicated every, time, every mm. moment. But as I said to them um, a couple of weeks ago, I said, you know, this is what like when you start a PhD, that you start thinking, oh, it's going to be very easy. And then you have the first and the second year, especially sort of half, half of the first year and the second, complete confusion. Because you've seen all the different aspects, you say, oh, I don't understand. And then suddenly, cling, the light comes, and, and you know, people are ma managed more or less to finish their PhD. So I think, you know, the confusion is norm no, uh, normal, don't worry. We, we, we have just to continue and we will find the answers. But don't think that we are going to have a very clear answer from now on. But do, is, presumably as you as the principal investigator on the project, have, mm. do you have a sense of responsibility to know a certain amount about each of the disciplines? Because there must be yeah. an element of that. But then there must come a point where obviously you can't. Yeah. So that's exactly. Yeah. I have, um, you know, like, uh, I mean, physical acoustics, I'm not even trying. I need to know, so the, the answer that I've given you before, I wouldn't have been able to give it two years ago, no way, oh, right. but you know, <laughs> just by reading, by, you know, because of the articles that we have written together with, I mean, together with Tomas, and then I sort of had to understand exactly, but there's no way, I haven't got the time to go into that. I haven't got the time to go into GIS, because we have also been doing soundscapes in GIS and so on. I, I, I don't have the time to learn GIS. What's I, GIS? GIS, um, Geographical Information Systems. Oh, right. So you put together, you, 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 you can uh, sort of model uh, how far a sound is going to reach oh, right. in the landscape, and you can map that. So we've been mapping visibility and audibility and comparing in an area in Alicante. So we have, there are three styles, and we uh, rock up styles, and we have been looking at whether people were favoring visibility or audibility, okay. and so on. So, it's, you know, but no, I'm not going to input the data, because there's no way, I haven't got the time. But, uh, so yes, I need to know a bit of everything, and I need to be more or less in control, but um, <laughs> yes, it's, it's not easy. It's, it's, it, it isn't easy, but... Yeah. To, to pick up on your analogy with a PhD, mm. what's your research question? What is the question that you hope to answer? The, 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 the question that I hope to answer is, um, you know, are there, is there a connection between rock art and uh, acoustics, and the acoustics? But then is... How, what can we learn from that? Because what I've seen, I mean, I thought that it was going to be a simple answer. And I see that, no, uh, there, may, there might be very, very different answers um, to this. 
but I want to learn more about the people and I want to bring the immaterial within archaeology. Mm -hmm. That has, it's an aspect that has never been sort of dealt with. Yeah. I want to learn more from people looking at something that has been disregarded so far in archaeology. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, that, that side of it makes absolute sense to me because I think of, for example, Tim Ingold talking yeah. about the difference between being in the centre of a landscape when you listen and being on the edge of a landscape when you look. So that, to, up to a point it makes sense. It's everything beyond that point that seems to me. I mean, if nothing else, you can write a fantastic paper on the contingencies and problematics of trying to do this kind of research. Yeah. That could be the first paper. <laughs> but just actually, apropos of that, um, uh, I, I will send you something else to read, okay. um, which is a paper that's just recently been published by our colleagues here in Environment and Humanities who are working in Namibia, okay. indeed in the same cool. area. Um, and their team includes um, environmental ethicist, environmental anthropologist, um, ethnomusicologist, okay. uh, people doing GIS. Um, I don't know that there's an archaeologist, but there are uh, conservation Perhaps. biologists. There are definitely some. Uh, they are based in the UK, all of them? They're here at Bath okay. Bar. And in fact, Mike unfortunately had to go and teach a philosophy class because he would have loved to talk with you. Okay. So I'll facilitate that afterwards. Okay. But um, Sean, so Sean's the anthropologist and Mike is a philosopher. And they have this conflict, this ongoing conflict. Um, to complicate matters, they're also partners. But they have this ongoing conflict uh, between her desire as an anthropologist to particularise. So she is one of these newfangled anthropologists who say there are no universals. Mm -hmm. And Mike, as an ethicist, wants to have universals. So they've actually written, they've written a paper ab about this tension um, in, in relation to their work uh, in Namibia. Very interesting. So I shall send it, I'll send, yes, it, send, it, send it your way. <laughs> That's good. And so, so someone who is working with Tillman is, uh, but yes, I won't read it, is, is an ethnomusicologist who has been trained, I think, again, is someone in between archaeology and ethnomusicology, but he has been um, publishing on the musical bows in mm. the area, mm. and there are some depictions of musical mm. bows. So one of the things that we could look is why these musical bows are, um, are uh, so these are sort of small questions, not not, not mm, but it's a not good one. Yeah, yeah <laughs> but really why good. here and not there? Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, mm -hmm. sorry, but this is uh, <laughs> uh, gone from your uh, question to or your mm -hmm. comment to another thing. But um, mm -hmm. but yes, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, um, there is quite a lot of because Namibia was part of the German um, of, of Germany or German colonial world. Um, mm -hmm. uh, this is why Tillman has yeah. is working. And so on. So, yeah, I, I, I will be very really interested to know about this group, and I'm sure that Tillman knows uh, about yeah. them if they are, if they have ethnomusicologists, and yeah. this is why I thought yeah. about the musical books. So, yeah. yeah. Is your head okay? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but yes, I mean, I'm very conscious of the huge mountain of I have to climb because it's, it's the challenge is, is huge um, in a way um, and it's not easy to, uh, to, to have this uh, team of people because if I were on, uh, on my own I would go my own pace but if you have a group you really need to keep them moving and, you know, and try to, to make the thing work and yeah. It's not. Uh, it's, it's one of the, the things that uh, when one applies uh, happily to an ERC, it doesn't quite consider. But yes, <laughs> it is. It is a challenge to be able to maintain the group together, to do the work together, and uh, to be able to coordinate all these dis different disciplines. Yeah. Uh, just one question. You show a picture of people wearing the like, virtual reality glasses. Mm. 
what were you showing them or what they were uh, looking at? Because you um, said they were trying to measure. We will be. Oh, you will be. We, we, we will, will be. be. It's not um, yet. Uh, oh. The idea is that we are going to create. So we could do two things. The one is very impractical. That's take people to the places to do, to then see what their sensations are when they are in that place listening to particular music, okay, and with the acoustics of that place. But, you know, there's no way that you can do that with, if you want uh, 120 participants. Okay. We're not going to take them to the Baja California or whatever. So we are going to, to do that in uh, the lab. This is, this is the idea. And so you will be recording something in the location and then play it back to them? No. With the acoustic measurements that we have taken, oh, if really music is recorded in an iconic chamber, an echoic chamber, we will be able to mix that sound with the acoustics of the place mm -hmm. and recreate mm -hmm. how something could, could sound in that place. Mm. Okay, but then you then use the, the stereo image of, of that, which makes like, it has a high impact, I think, on the listener. We have, uh, they will have these glasses, the 3D glasses, so they will be able to sense the landscape and you know you have I don't know whether you have had these glasses sometimes oh, yeah, that people go completely into yeah, it. Yeah. yeah. I mean but as I said, I can see all the problems. What music are we going to <laughs> Yeah. Or are they going to be just um, just the sounds? Um, these are things that that's why I put already in November the anthropologist and the uh, the, the professor in acoustics and um, the neuropsychologist mm -hmm. and psychoacoustician together mm -hmm. for us to start discussing how we are going to do this. F to do something that can have some sense. True. And, you know, because it has <coughs> all sorts of problems. Mm. Yeah. Can I say just something? While uh, you said you're using like only directional mic and few equipment to record mm. the uh, ambient sound. There is something they call binaural microphones. Yeah, that's right. Are you using yeah. that one that shape like two ears or, or like the whole head oh. where you put it and right. takes the whole image of We were thinking sound. of having, I mean, there are, we were discussing possibilities. Um, the, uh, the acoustical engineer was saying, just you can take a sort of a head yes. and put some microphones, mm -hmm. but then you know, uh, then it depends on the size of that head, or if it's someone of us, it depends on the size of the head. So every person re uh, hears in a different way, depending on the distance of their ears. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. So one of the first things that we want to do, we might be doing if it's not very complicated, is measuring the distance. So that people, that what people hear is what they would have heard being in that place depending on, on their, of the size of their head. <laughs> That's <laughs> that, <pretty yeah>. cool. <laughs> Okay? That's fascinating. I, I would have never thought that that had, was going to have such an impact, but they insist that yes, it had an impact. So anyway, you know, I mean, we were sort of, given that we are experimenting and then we had the money, why not? We can, you know, they can play with these things. And I'm sure that there will be interesting um, uh, articles from that. Um, why not? I just have one suggestion for, you know, uh, a situation about impact, perhaps, and um, about, like, what people might going to be thinking or commenting in a way that can be a kind of criticism Perhaps one way is kind of open for the public in your website or something like this. Which direction could be the best one for for dealing with that? Like you know, how they want to experience, like you know, that way or that way. Like these more people gonna get involved, and then somehow the decision is made by the people from the local areas where they are, and then um, you know how they want to hear their own music. You know, that, that's the technology. That's the technology we have available. 
you feel, which, which way can we do? We're gonna do the research anyway. Which do you think is the best way for that? It that might be, I mean, if that's a good idea, perhaps, I mean, either for research or even for impact, as you say, you say, would you like to hear Beethoven, the, Beethoven the Sixth <laughs> Symphony, <laughs> as if you were in, you know, Namibia, in this side, in uh, the White Lady Shelter. And, uh, you know, it could be. I mean, I am very conscious because of this insistence that I learned when I was here working in Durham. Um, of impact, 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 and you know, okay, to start with, I was, oh, what a pain. Then you get to the, okay, fine, um, you do it, and uh, in fact, you enjoy it, and you like it. So we are paying attention to impact, and uh, so this this can be a good idea, even for, as I am saying, but perhaps I would think uh, about uh, the other aspects sort of before. Uh, um, but we are sort of uh, looking at, so I've got someone who is searching, who is looking at the, face, uh, the Facebook uh, page. And uh, we are, um, one of the things that I want to do, one of the uh, articles that I want to write, uh, I want the group to write, is one about the impact that we are having with the Facebook. Because it is amazing. You know, I've never paid much attention to these things. And I have never, my Facebook page was half dead. But now, because of the project, I am having to pay a bit more attention. And even if they say that the very young people are not using Facebook anymore, but the impact that we are having and the few things, because this, this project, this music, really attracts attention. And it's something that people feel. Mm -hmm. And that people, you know, um, um, are more prone to to follow and to pay attention to is something that reaches people very, um, you know, they touches um, touch um, uh, it touches um, them, and anyway, so uh, we are follow uh, we are keeping an eye on developments and trying to see in what ways we can impact more with um, the research. That's so so nice. that's a good idea. That's very nice. Mm -hmm. So, for example, yesterday we had uh, Tillman gave a talk yesterday, and uh, the, the talk is not going to be online, but we have a five-minute thing. And with uh, Andrzej Rozwadkowski, it's also the same. We already have a YouTube uh, channel, and um, everybody who comes to give a seminar will have a five-minute thing explaining what they have been talking about. So that's the type of things that you can do when you have a team. I've been running around all my life trying to do everything myself, but now that I have people and so on, I can sort of say, oh, let's think about this and let's see what happens. It is, it is fun. It is fun, but yes, it is. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I'll, uh, that's a good idea. I mean, for research, I'm not sure. I, I would have to think about it. Um, sort of giving people the choice, although I think that that was one of the things that we discussed. Uh, we had the first meeting, we need to have more meetings, and uh, uh, there's going to be a PhD student uh, soon in the project, w working in that area, and then um, I will ask, because I can't ask the professor to come to our meetings every, every week, but the, the students will come every week. The, uh, the, the one dealing with psychoacoustics, and uh, I want to integrate more. I mean, until now it has been, we have had some discussions, but it has been a more a dormant uh, uh, aspect of the project because it, it was supposed to start in the second year, and that was the idea. Yeah, perhaps ask a question, uh, research for who can help uh, to answer the uh, research for who? Um, you mean why we are dealing with? I mean, there's, you could say that for archaeology. Why do we need to bother with archaeology? All these people, you know, they are not here anymore, and and this is it is related. So it's, this is not an answer for my project, but for archaeology in general, it is related to identity, not national identity necessarily, but the identity where people live. Mm -hmm. And what I meant is like towards the direction that the research. Will that's why I said, like, the research is being done for who? And then perhaps you help us to answer the question. Well, what we can create is things that are going to attract people. I mean, if they are useful for our research, fantastic. But otherwise, we can.
create things if it is not very time consuming because the, the priority has to be research. Um, we can create things for people to enjoy and to use the product of the things that we have created. Okay, but perhaps this is not interesting for our research in itself. So if you want to listen to particular music with, uh, with in the conditions, the acoustic conditions of, of a particular place that is many hundred thousand kilometers away. Uh, the problem for that is that there are not that many uh, recordings made of, for example, Beethoven or um, and in anechoic chambers because it's so difficult because you don't hear the, the impact that your instrument is having so there are not that many uh, recordings well thank you very much Margaret. a very fascinating insight into your project hopefully you can come back in a few years and tell us how it's all gone <laughs> thank you thank, thank you very much, much.